Well, good evening, everyone, and glad to have you with us. Welcome to uh, the Bush Center for Faith and Culture. Tonight, we welcome back Dr. Michael Ward as our guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Ward is Senior Research Fellow at Blackfriars, uh, University of Oxford. What I like about it is right across from uh, the Eagle and the Child, uh, so, and so which is where the Inklings uh, used to meet. Uh, he studied English at Oxford, theology at Cambridge, and has his PhD in divinity from St. Andrews. And so he just covered the whole British Isles with his educational experience. He is the author of the award-winning uh, book, Planet Narnia, The Seven Heavens in the Imagination of C.S. Lewis, published by Oxford University Press. He is co-editor uh, editor of the Cambridge Companion to C.S. Lewis. Uh, and though based at uh, Blackfriars in Oxford, Dr. Ward is also employed as professor of apologetics at Houston Baptist University, teaching one course per semester there as part of the online, online MA program in Christian apologetics. But he says in his bio that this is not his chief claim to fame. That would be that he handed a pair of x-ray spectacles to James Bond in the movie, The World Is Not Enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Ward tonight will be lecturing on Planet Narnia. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Ward? Thank you, Ken. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, do please come in. There are some seats, particularly on the front. People never sit on the front. Uh, yes. Come up higher, brother. Come up higher. I'm very glad to be back at Sebbets. I think it's, uh, it's nearly three years since I was last here. Uh, many thanks to Todd von Helms for arranging it. Um, before I begin, I ought to, I'm sort of under a contractual obligation to say just a little bit about my work at Houston Baptist, because I don't just teach at Oxford, I teach online for the MA program in apologetics at HBU. And if any of you wanting to extend your knowledge of apologetics after you've left this fine institution, uh, please consider uh, our online program or tell those who you know who might be interested in, in doing some distance learning on that subject. We have a fine program with, a, with an emphasis on imaginative and cultural apologetics, a good deal on uh, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and Chesterton and other writers like that. Commercial over. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Those are the opening verses of Psalm 19, which C.S. Lewis described as the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the finest lyrics in the world. And it's about C.S. Lewis's view of the heavens that I want to speak to you tonight, and, and in particular how he understood the seven heavens of the medieval cosmos and how, I believe, he used the imagery of those seven heavens <laughs> in the books for which he is best known, the Seven Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, I expect everybody here has some familiar familiarity with these chronicles. Uh, they are some of the, the best-selling, most widely read books of the second half of the 20th century, and they've been introduced to a whole new generation of people uh, recently by the film versions of the first three stories. Though if you ask me, the less said about those films, the better. <laughs> uh, but I wonder if you've ever sat back from your enjoyment of these stories, assuming you do enjoy them, not everybody does, um, and ask yourself why Lewis wrote them the way that he did. When you ask that question, the answer is not very easily obtained. When C.S. Lewis read aloud the first few chapters of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe to his great friend, uh, J.R.R.R.R. Tolkien, um, uh, Tolkien hated what he was hearing. He strongly detested the way Lewis had assembled the story out of what he, Tolkien, regarded as incompatible mythological traditions. English children, straight out of the pages of an E. Nesbitt story, centaurs and fauns and dryads and naiads out of Greek or Roman mythology, 
a white witch character out of a Hans Anderson fairy tale. Father Christmas, for goodness sake, what's he doing in this story? <laughs> and Tolkien thought this was an abomination, that you should not write stories in this way. And if you know the Lord of the Rings, you know that the Middle Earth, Tolkien's sub-created world, is refined to the nth degree of sophistication. He, he polished it and polished it and polished it for decades making everything ring with this inner consistency of reality, as Tolkien put it. Narnia is quite different. It seems to be a bit of a hodgepodge, a mishmash, a bit slapdash even, some people have said. But Tolkien didn't know the Narnia books very well. He reacted against them so strongly that he soon gave up showing any interest in them, and he later confessed that they were entirely outside his range of imaginative sympathy. Lewis loved The Lord of the Rings and nagged Tolkien to finish writing The Lord of the Rings. Um, Tolkien did not return that high esteem for Lewis's imaginative work. Sometimes people think that Lewis and Tolkien were, are, were a mutual admiration society, soft-soaping each other, but um, it was more like they had a love-hate relationship. Lewis loved Tolkien's work and Tolkien hated Lewis's work. <laughs> But because Tolkien has become so famous, his attitude to Narnia has become very well known too. And lots of people have assumed that Tolkien knew the books much better than he actually did. And lots of critics and scholars have followed in Tolkien's wake, assessing the books as a bit, of, as a bit random, a bit slapdash, a bit chaotic. I mean, they work fine, they're enjoyable reads, and they're good enough to give to our children, aren't they? But, but they're not great literature. The only problem with that is, well, first of all, these books have become classics. If Lewis dashed these books off in an afternoon without much care or forethought, and yet they still became canonical works of English children's fiction, that itself requires explanation. <laughs> Is that really how classic works of children's literature are written? But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, it runs counter to everything we know about C.S. Lewis, that he should do anything in a slapdash or random fashion, because he wasn't characteristically a, a random or a slapdash writer or thinker. He was a very rigorous and consistent thinker who had very good reasons for everything he did and said. Let me give you three quick examples. His poetry is fantastically complex, mind-bogglingly complex. If you look at some of Lewis's poems, you think you've worked out the rhyme scheme and the meter, then you look more closely and a whole other dimension of complexity reveals itself beneath the one you first noticed. He once said that he was enamoured of metrical and phonetic subtleties and the poems which look as if they are in free verse are often in the most complicated metres of all. As a medievalist, he loved studying the writings of Dante and Chaucer and Spencer and Milton, writers, he said, who love to present us with something which can't be taken in at a glance. Everything leads to everything else in these writers, he says, but often by very intricate paths. Complexity, he says, is a mark of the medieval mind. And as a medievally minded scholar himself, C.S. Lewis, I think, could be expected to very possibly, perhaps probably, imitate the example of these authors that he so admired and so closely studied. Thirdly, Lewis as a Christian believed that the universe itself, the real world, is a fantastically intricate work of divine artistry. Every single thing in creation having been made for a purpose. We mere humans in our finite capacity can't possibly, even in principle, understand the purposes of God in creation, but it was an article of faith for C.S. Lewis that those purposes did exist. God is working his purposes out as year succeeds to year, despite many appearances to the contrary. When we see accidents happen and the innocent suffer and all sorts of inexplicable events, we are often tempted to assume that there is no guiding hand on the tiller and that providence is just a wish fulfillment fantasy. So we are tempted, very often, to think. But no, Lewis thought, being a Christian, if you can believe that Christ's crucifixion was providential, the way that God chose to save the world, then you can believe that even the apparent randomness of this universe 
may have deeper purposes behind it, ultimately, finally, when all is said and done. God is working his purposes out down to the curve of every wave and the flight of every insect, as Lewis puts it in his book on prayer. So when you consider those three things, Lewis's own complex poetry, his love of complex medieval literature and his beliefs about God's complex creative act, and you turn back to Narnia, it's supposedly a hodgepodge, it's supposedly a mishmash. You've got major cognitive dissonance there. And lots of Lewis scholars and critics have pointed this out, and they have therefore gone looking for an additional level of complexity or design to the Narnia Chronicles that might tie them together a bit more satisfactorily than they are tied together at the, at the superficial level of the, of the literary and mythological traditions that Lewis is drawing upon. The obvious place to look for a deeper level of coherence and design within the Narnia books is, of course, the biblical parallels, because Lewis himself once said that the whole Narnia series is about Christ. The whole Narnia series, he says, is about Christ. And the Christ character, Aslan, the Lion King, is very Christ-like, part particularly in these three stories. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe gives us Aslan as Christ, the Redeemer. The Magician's Nephew gives us Aslan as Christ, the Creator. And the Last Battle gives us Aslan as Christ, the Judge. The biblical parallels in these three stories are very clear and obvious. You can't miss them if you've got any biblical knowledge at all. But these are only three out of seven books. This is less than half the series. What about the other four books? When you turn to these four, Aslan is still present, yes, and he's still Christ-like in various ways. He's the center of the story, emotionally and logically. He's, he's guiding people, he's challenging people. But there's no major episode or, ep or element of Christ's life or ministry or divine office that Lewis is reimagining in these four books, as, as he did in these three. In these four, you might have expected Lewis to give us Narnian equivalents of, say, the nativity of Christ. A whole Narnia story about the birth of Aslan into Narnia as a lion cub, as Jesus is born into Bethlehem as a baby. But you don't get that. You don't get a Narnian equivalent of the ascension of Christ. You don't get a Narnian equivalent of the day of Pentecost, when Christ sends his spirit on the church. Why not? Given what he's done in these three books, wouldn't that be the natural way to proceed? But in these four books, what do you get? In Prince Caspian, you have Aslan entering the story amongst dancing trees before giving a great war cry. In the Dawn Treader, Aslan is seen flying in a sunbeam as a bird. In the Silver Chair, he doesn't actually come down to Narnia at all. He's confined to his own high country above the clouds, which would seem to be more like an Old Testament understanding of the divine figure, not a Christian one. And in The Horse and His Boy, Aslan is mistaken for two lions, or possibly three lions, and we're told, no, there was only one lion, but he was swift of foot. He does a great deal of dashing about in that story. Why? I don't recall Jesus in the New Testament being a notable sprinter or having a special ministry to athletes. You know, why did Lewis make that imaginative choice? These are questions that don't usually occur to us while we're just enjoying the books because they, they read well enough. They hang together as stories. But when you're exploring them for pattern and design and coherence and complexity and intricacy, they don't seem to hang together very obviously at all either at this Christological level or the level, as we've already said, of the literary traditions. And yet, we still have this very well-attested fact that Lewis was interested in complexity and intricacy of all kinds. So at this point, some scholars throw up their hands and say, oh, well, they're, you know, they're just for children, aren't they? They're, 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 com they're complex enough. Don't push it. But other scholars, I think probably the majority of scholars, have said there must be more going on here than meets the eye. And all sorts of different theories have been suggested about what might be the fundamental patterning design to the Chronicles. 
what really ties them together as a septet? Maybe it's the seven deadly sins. Maybe it's the seven sacraments. Maybe it's the seven books of Spencer's Fairy Queen. All these sevens have been suggested as possible themes, but none of them has really persuaded anybody. I myself once made a half-hearted attempt to link the Chronicles to different plays by Shakespeare. Because there are lots of Shakespearean allusions in the series. But although that worked well enough for three or four of the books, for the remainder I really had to sort of crowbar <laughs> the, 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 the theory to fit. And you know when you're just imposing something on a series of books. It didn't really explain anything very helpfully. But it was when I wasn't looking for it that I believe I stumbled across the real answer to this imaginative puzzle that the Narnia Chronicles present. I was halfway through my PhD researches into Lewis's theological imagination at the time. I was lying in bed one night at about 11.30 at night. I was reading a long poem that Lewis wrote about the planets, the medieval planets, when an idea occurred to me. And I'll come back to that later in the talk. I took this idea to my PhD supervisor, and he said, hmm, that's interesting. You should probably pursue that. So I did. I reframed my whole PhD and eventually got it published, as Ken said, as this book, Planet Narnia. And then the BBC got interested, and they commissioned a television documentary called The Narnia Code. Please excuse the terrible title. This has got nothing to do with the Da Vinci Code. Uh, this is serious scholarship. Uh, <laughs> But what I want to do in the remaining time, I, I'm going to speak for until pr possibly about 8 o'clock, if that's all right. Um, what I want to do in the remaining time is, is introduce you to, to the substance of this discovery as I believe it to be. But it's a big claim that I'm making, that Lewis had a secret imaginative scheme to the Narnia Chronicles that he told nobody about, not even for close friends like Tolkien, and which nobody else spotted until I came along 60 years after the fact. And <laughs> I mean, who do I think I am? Uh, this is preposterously arrogant claim, you might think. And you'll be, fa you know, be fair enough to think that. I, I would conclude the same if someone came to me with such a preposterous claim. But listen to the evidence, and you will see, I hope, that it stacks up remarkably convincingly. But it is a big claim. And so before we come on to the substance of the argument itself, uh, let me give you... I think four background reasons as to why Lewis might have done such a thing, even before we try to prove that he did such a thing. And the first of these four background reasons has to do with Lewis himself, his own personality. He could be very secretive when he wanted to be. Jack never ceased to be secretive. That's the verdict of George Sayer, who knew Lewis for 30 years and wrote a biography about him. Jack never ceased to be secret. You know that C.S. Lewis was called Jack, do you? He didn't like the name Clive, and he hated the name Staples, so he was always known as Jack. <laughs> Jack never ceased to be secretive. And if we're looking for examples of his secretiveness, the most obvious, probably, is the fact that when he got married in his late 50s, he kept his marriage secret for the best part of a year. Not even close friends like Tolkien were told. If you know the film Shadowlands, if you're familiar with this part of Lewis's biography, you, are, you will know. He got married and told nobody about it. Extraordinary thing to do. The whole point of a marriage is that it's a public relationship. A man who can keep his marriage secret can keep anything secret, <laughs> if you ask me. <laughs> but there are other examples. And just to mention one other example, uh, his autobiography, Surprised by Joy left out so many significant things that one of his friends jokingly said, you should not have called this surprised by joy. You should have called this suppressed by Jack. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, even if we admit that Lewis could be very secretive, that proves nothing about Narnia. But I'm just saying this is the kind of man we're dealing with. It shouldn't surprise us that there may be more going on to Narnia than meets the eye. That's the first background point. Let's call that the temperamental or the psychological background point. So from psychology, let us move to theology or Christology and look at this verse from Colossians. For all things were created through Christ and for Christ – 
and in Christ all things hold together. Now I put this up because Lewis was interested in this verse and he paraphrases it in one of his books. He paraphrases it as Christ is the all-pervasive principle of cohesion whereby the universe holds together. Christ is the all-pervasive principle of cohesion whereby the universe holds together. Now remember, he said that the Narnia series is all about Christ. And when we hear him say that, we immediately think of Aslan, the Christ character, who does the Christ-like things. We don't tend to think of this aspect of Christ, what we might call the cosmic Christ, or the, the omnipresent Christ, because this is a much harder thing to conceptualize. If this is true, as Lewis believed it was, then even our very understanding of Christ is held together in Christ, because all things are held together in Christ. We can't get outside him and look back at him as if from some external spectator's point of view. And therefore, if we're not careful, we can overlook this most obvious and fundamental truth about the universe. And this is what Lewis homes in on in his book Miracles, where he says, the fact which is in one respect the most obvious and primary fact, namely God, the Trinitarian God of Christian theology, and through which alone you have access to all the other facts, may be precisely the one that's most easily forgotten. Forgotten not because it's so remote or abstruse, but because it's so near and so obvious. And that is exactly how the supernatural has been forgotten. We can overlook God because, in a sense, he's everywhere. We know God before we know anything else whatsoever. God is the very ground of our knowing. If you want to hide something, put it in the open. Familiarity breeds contempt. But absence makes the heart grow fonder. Yet we can't get absent from God in this sense. We can't escape him. You know, if I take the wings of the morning and fly to the uttermost parts of the sea, thou art there. If I make my bed in shale, thou art there. You can't get out. And therefore, you can become contemptuous of that which is so utterly familiar. You can forget the thing which is most obvious. So, if the Narnia series is all about Christ... It's pretty obvious how Aslan is Christ-like. He's the incarnate word. But what about the, the discarnate or the unincarnate word which is holding all things in being? That would be a much harder thing to depict because it would have to be in every part of the story at once, not just located in one particular character. So how would Lewis depict a universal cosmic spirit which was in everything at once? Keep that question in mind. That's our second background point. Now our third background point is literary, the Kappa element in romance. This is the title of an essay Lewis wrote, and Kappa is the initial letter of the Greek word krypton, which means cryptic or hidden. So the title of his paper basically means the hidden element in story. Romance here just means a story. Lewis wrote an essay called The Hidden Element in Story. <laughs> this should alert us to the possibility that there may be more going on in Narnia than meets the eye. The only problem is that he never published this essay under this title, so most people don't know of its existence. He later wrote it up under a different title, On Stories, but he dropped the term Kappa from that essay. He was basically still talking about the same thing. And in On Stories, he says this, to be stories at all, stories must be series of events, but it must be understood that this series, the plot as we call it, is only really a net whereby to catch something else. The real theme may be, and perhaps usually is, something that has no sequence in it, something other than a process and much more like a state or a quality. Now, this state or quality of a well-told story is the hidden element, the kappa element. And why is it hidden? 
because it's woven into every part of the story at once. It's not just an actor in the story or a theme. No, it's the whole work together. It's, a, it's, a, it's the gestalt. It's the holistic effect of the atmosphere, the flavor, the tone of the whole story. There are stories which are all plot and no atmosphere. Think of your typical, I don't know, the most wooden example of, of an Agatha Christie kind of whodunit, which is a very clever plot, but not much more than that. But think of a really great novel, like, say, Pride and Prejudice. That has a great plot, yes, but it also has a great atmosphere. It's believable. The characters are three-dimensional. The world has a kind of resonance and the believability to it. You like going back to Pride and Prejudice because you move about in that world almost as if it's real. In a way, you don't with Agatha Christie. Once you've read Agatha Christie once, you tend not to go back to what she has to offer you. But the thing about the Jane Austen atmosphere is, is that it is pervasive. We might even say it's the all-pervasive principle of cohesion whereby Pride and Prejudice holds together. It's the literary equivalent of the Christological truth which obtains in the real world. But it's hidden while you are living the story because it's woven into everything at once. I mean, you can close the book and reflect upon it, so in that sense you can get outside it, as we can't get outside the Christological universality. But for as long as you're living the story, you aren't noticing the atmosphere because you're breathing it in. That's our third background point, the kappa element in romance. Now our fourth and final background point is transferred classicism. Now this is a term that Lewis coined when he was writing a review of the Oxford Book of Christian Verse. And he's talking about how Christian poets, as late as the 17th century, would reach back into the classical past, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, those mythologies, and they would find in those mythologies all sorts of classical characters and tropes and motifs and themes, and they would transfer them into their Christian poetry. This is the best way, Lewis says, of writing literature which is religious without being devotional. You dress up your Christian themes under the mask of Apollos, uh, Apollo or Venus or Jupiter or whoever it may be as a way of talking about Christianity. Paganism, Lewis says, is the religion of poetry in the Middle Ages and the early Renaissance through which the author can say so much or so little of his real religion as his art requires. And everyone is in the secret. Everybody knows that this is what's going on. It's, it's a Christian exploitation of the classical past. It's a little bit like what we find St. Paul doing in the book of Acts. Remember in Acts 17 when he preaches to the Athenians saying, God is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. And who is St. Paul quoting there? Aratus and Epimenides, two Greek poets who wrote poems about Zeus. In Zeus we live and move and have our being, is what the original said, for we are indeed Zeus's offspring. Now, St. Paul is obviously not recommending that the Athenians worship Zeus, but he's exploiting what the Athenians understand about Zeus in order to gain traction for his presentation of the Christian gospel. It's transferred classicism of a, of a kind. It's, it's similar to what the medieval writers would do many centuries later. God, the Christian God, Lewis says, will often appear in medieval art but masked, dressed up as Jupiter or Zeus or whoever it may be, and everyone is in the secret. That's our fourth background point. So we can now return to Narnia and how Narnia holds together. Let's just quickly recap the four points we've covered. Lewis could be secretive, personally, we know that. Lewis's theology involved an understanding of God's invisibility or hiddenness by virtue of God's omnipresence in creation. We saw a literary equivalent of that in the kappa element, the pervasive atmosphere of a well-told tale, which you don't notice while you're living the story. And then transfer to classicism, God can be hidden 
under a pagan veil. Those are our four background points. Now, Narnia. Why, does it, why is it like it is? <coughs> and at this point, we should remind ourselves that although Lewis is best known for Narnia, he wasn't professionally a writer of fiction. He was professionally an academic who taught at Oxford for 30 years. And the biggest book he ever wrote was this. English literature in the 16th century excluding drama. A snappy title, if ever there was one. And it was part of this Oxford history of English literature, a multi-volume series by many different authors. And Lewis abbreviated Oxford history of English literature to oh hell. <laughs> he called this his oh hell volume. Uh, it took him 15 years to write this. And when he published it in 1954, he wrote to a friend and said, thank goodness I've finished this big academic work I've been engaged in for the last decade and a half. It was the top tune all those years, he says. And all the other books I published during that period were just its little twiddly bits. Which means Narnia is the twiddly bits upon this massive intellectual enterprise. If we think of Lewis first and foremost as the guy who writes Narnia, and only secondarily as the man who writes this sort of book, we get him completely back to front. We mistake the twiddly bits for the main theme. If we want to understand Narnia, I would suggest we need to understand the man who could write this kind of work. And if you ever read this work, which I would encourage you to do because it's very, very readable and enjoyable, uh, you'll find that it opens with a long discussion of the new astronomy that came in in the 16th century thanks to this chap, Nicholas Copernicus, who, as you all remember from your history of science lessons, revolutionised astronomy with his theory of the heliocentric universe. And Lewis was interested in this because he wanted to see how it played out in the literature of the period. Because, of course, the kind of cosmos you believe yourself to be living in will have a major effect, sooner or later, upon the, the art of that period. You know, a, a lot of modern and postmodern uh, presentations of, of uh, randomness or incommensurability or relativity, relativism, come out of Einstein and the general theory of relativity. That, 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 that's not a coincidence. The cosmological background has an effect upon the literature of a period. And so when Copernicus completely revolutionizes our model of the cosmos, well, Copernicus is kind of a big deal. <laughs> uh, and Lewis certainly thought so. And that's why he returns to the question of cosmological models in his last book, The Discarded Image. Three times in this book, Lewis encourages his readers to take a w walk under the sky at night and to look up at the night sky as if they still believed in the pre-Copernican universe, as if they still believed that the Earth was static and central and surrounded not by empty space, as we now think, but by the heavens, the seven concentric spheres or heavens rotating around the static and central Earth, each heaven with its own planet, and each planet with its own influences that it would shed upon the earth and upon people and events and even the metals in earth's crust. Let's just remind ourselves of these seven heavens. The first is the moon, the second is Mercury, third Venus, fourthly the sun. The sun, remember, is a planet according to pre-Copernican astronomy. Mars, Jupiter and Saturn complete the septet. These are the seven heavens. And this is the model of the cosmos that we no longer believe in. This is why Lewis calls his book The Discarded Image. We have discarded this image. We no longer believe the universe to be like this. However, we have retained an awareness of it in at least one respect, because, of course, it's from these seven heavens that we take the names of the days of the week. What's today? Tuesday? Martes in Spanish, think of Mardi in French, the day of Mars. Or the day of Tyr in Norse mythology, that's the Norse equivalent of Mars. So every day of our lives, actually, we're referring back to this old system. Though in other respects we have forgotten and discarded it. But Lewis hadn't forgotten or discarded it because it was his professional job to retain an awareness of it 
in order to understand the literature of the pre-Copernican period as a medievalist. You can't understand Dante's Divine Comedy if you don't understand this cosmos, because it's everywhere presupposed in Dante. Look at this uh, illustration from an edition of the Divine Comedy, which shows you the seven planetary characters in the order of the days of the week. So here on the left you have the sun in his burning fiery chariot. We come across to the moon in her silvery gown holding her crescent. Then we come to Martes, Tuesday, Mars, the god of war with his helmet and his chain mail. This is Mercury, Miercules. We know that because of the wings on his heels because Mercury is the fleet-footed messenger of the gods. Here we come to Thursday, Jove's day, Jerdi, Jueves. Jove is the king. That's why he's got that scepter over his shoulder. That's not just any old rod or cane. That's a, the kingly scepter because Jupiter is above all things regal and monarchical. For Friday, for Viennes, Venus in her green gown, associated with fertility, creativity, love. When you venerate someone, you're lovingly respecting them because Venus is inspiring you to venerate. There's the, the trace of the influence lingering in our language. And here's Satur Saturn for Saturday with his sickle. Sat Saturn is like a, an old version of the Grim Reaper, cutting people down, bringing about death and disaster, associated with old age and pestilence and treachery and mostly negative things. It's not just Dante, though, who uses this old cosmological symbolism. Chaucer uses it too. And I found this page of notes in C.S. Lewis's handwriting. This is from Lewis's complete Chaucer. These, these are the end leaves of his complete Chaucer. And he's making notes here about the knight's tale, Chaucer's knight's tale from the Canterbury Tales. And he says that Chaucer uses the planetary characters very interestingly in the knight's tale. He doesn't just put them as actors into the drama, but he weaves the appropriate influences into the plot so that the climax of the Knight's Tale, for instance, happens on a Tuesday, on the day of Mars. How appropriate for a story about knights. So Lewis has this detailed scholarly familiarity with this old co cosmological symbolism, but he also responds to it more personally. Uh, I've already talked about Psalm 19 and his high esteem for Psalm 19, the greatest poem in the book of Psalms. He was quite a keen amateur astronomer. He pointed out unusual conjunctions in the night sky. He had a telescope on the balcony of his bedroom. He liked going to the local observatory. But he also responded to the heavens imaginatively. He wrote a trilogy of interplanetary adventures, the Cosmic Trilogy, sometimes called the Space Trilogy. This is the first book set on Mars. The second book is set on Venus, and in the third book, the planetary powers actually come down to Earth to bring about the end of the story. It's all explicit there. You can't miss it. Why was he so interested in all this? He said this, The characters of the planets seem to me to have a permanent value as spiritual symbols, which is especially worthwhile in our own generation. Of Saturn we know more than enough, but who does not need to be reminded of Jove? Jupiter. Now this is a really crucial quotation for my whole argument because this shows us that Lewis didn't just think of the planets as, as a medieval curiosity. He thought of them as perduring archetypes in the human imagination. They have a permanent value as spiritual symbols. You can sort of divide up the whole of our spiritual experience into these seven categories. It's like the seven colors of the rainbow. Everything from birth under Venus all the way through to death under Saturn and everything in between. And indeed, he says they are especially worthwhile in his own generation because his own generation was the generation that went through the First World War. Of Saturn, we know more than enough. Three quarters of a million British servicemen were cut down by Saturn's scythe during the First World War. Lewis was very nearly one of them. He was a teenage officer in the Great War, and he was blown up in his trench in the spring of 1918. 
and had an out-of-body experience. He looked down on himself from a great height, and the thought occurred to him, here is a picture of a man dying. He thought he was dying. He was very nearly one of Saturn's victims. But of course he survived, and he was invalided back to England, and he spent six months recovering from his war wounds. But that's why he says of Saturn we know more than enough. And elsewhere, Lewis will say that much of the culture of the 1920s and 30s was as he puts it, Saturnocentric, Saturnocentric, fixated upon the Saturnine qualities of death and disaster and cynicism and pessimism. Hence, you know, the growth of modernism and absurdism and the theatre of cruelty and, and all those developments in, in art and culture coming out of the great trauma of the First World War. A very natural, understandable reaction but the great thing about the seven planets is that they show that Saturn is not the only way of symbolizing spiritual reality. There are six other options. And Saturn is not the best of the seven in any case. Jove, Jupiter, is the best because Jupiter is the king. And we must think of a king at peace, enthroned, taking his leisure, serene, tranquil, magnanimous, prosperous, festive. Those are the jovial qualities associated in medieval thought with the planet of Jupiter. So you see where I'm going with this. When Lewis came to write the Narnia Chronicles, I believe he used these seven spiritual symbols again, but this time secretly, implicitly. He'd use them explicitly in his cosmic trilogy. He'd written about them explicitly in his academic works. But here in Narnia, he takes one planet per book and turns its set of qualities, its characteristics, its influences, and he uses that set of attributes as his imaginative blueprint for each Narnia chronicle. Aslan sums up those qualities in his own person he is the true Jupiter, the true Mars, the true Venus, and so on, seven times over. But those qualities of Aslan are also spread abroad across the rest of the tale, in the children, and in the way they interact with Aslan, and in the background details, and the ornamental trivia, so it might seem. So that each book has a kappa element, a pervasive tone or flavour. Now, we don't have time to go into all seven books, um, but we do have time to go through probably the first three books in, in some detail, just to give you a sense of what I mean. And the first, therefore, is Jupiter. Jupiter is the best planet, Lewis said, and here is the planet Jupiter, and here in the southeast corner you can just make out the great red spot, Jupiter's great red eye which is a storm perpetually raging on the surface of Jupiter. And the, the diameter of that eye is greater than the diameter of Earth. You could fit the whole of our planet inside that eye. It shows you how massive Jupiter is. And here is Jupiter, the king of the gods. Jupiter in Roman mythology, Zeus in Greek mythology, Thor in Norse mythology. And this, this is where we come to that nighttime experience that I told you about at the start when I was lying in bed reading the poem Lewis wrote about the planets. A long complicated poem about the medieval planets and I'm reading it and I get to the lines about Jupiter and I do a double take when I read these lines. Of wrath ended and woes mended, of winter past and guilt forgiven and good fortune Jove is master. I do a double take, particularly with respect to these five words, winter past and guilt forgiven. <laughs> I say to myself, that's very like a five-word summary of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, <laughs> which is all about the passing of winter and the forgiving of guilt. You remember how the White Witch has made it always winter but never Christmas? And her kingdom of ice and snow is defeated at the coming of Aslan when he shakes his mane... We shall have spring again. When he bears his teeth, winter meets its teeth. <laughs> As I always wanted to say, I was troubled by that half rhyme as a boy. 
death and teeth, they don't rhyme. <laughs> and guilt is forgiven. So I look more closely at the symbolism of Jupiter in Lewis's works, and a great deal of the symbolism in his other writings seems to accord with remarkable closeness to what's going on in the first Narnia Chronicle. Principally kingship. Jupiter is above all things of the king, as I've said. And remember how Aslan is introduced in this first story. The children think he might be a, a regular man. They don't know who he is in this first tale, but they're told, Aslan a man? He's the king of the wood. That's the very first description given of him. He's not safe, but he's good. He's the king. We're told that he has a royal head, a royal standard, a royal pavilion, all these regal accoutrements. And the children themselves become regal as they relate to him. They become kings and queens by the end of the story. Once a king in Narnia, always a king in Narnia. Once a queen in Narnia, always a queen in Narnia. We're told repeatedly at the end of the tale. The story is really a clash of kingship between Edmund and Peter. Edmund, you remember, has been ensnared by the White Witch, and she's pretending that she's the Empress of Narnia. And she's ensnared Edmund with the promise... We always remember the Turkish delight, don't we? But the <laughs> it's not the Turkish delight that really motivates Edmund's treachery. That's just the bait on the hook. What reels Edmund in is the prospect of becoming the king after she's gone, after the witch has gone, so that he can then, Edmund can then, pay Peter back for calling him a beast. It's a terrible case of sibling rivalry in this story. And that's for <laughs> but it's about kingship. Who's going to be king? Peter, on the other hand, he's taken by Aslan and he's shown the castle with the four thrones, in one of which he must sit as high king over all the rest. Over all the rest. Include, over all the rest of his siblings, that is. Including Edmund, because Edmund does indeed, at the end of the story, become a good king. But only after Aslan has demonstrated true kingship in his sacrifice for Edmund's sake. But what's that got to do with Jupiter? I mean, okay, there's something about guilt forgiven here, but really, all you know, that episode about Aslan dying on the stone table and coming back to life, isn't that just a convenient Sunday school lesson inserted into the, into the tale so it's edifying for Lewis's young readers? What's it got to do with Jupiter? Well, interestingly, in the same year that Lewis began writing The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe in earnest, he published another book, on the poetry of his great friend Charles Williams, one of the Inklings. And in that book, Lewis says this, when Charles Williams writes of Jupiter's red-pierced planet, he assumes that the huge reddish spot which astronomers observe on the surface of Jupiter is a wound, and the redness is that of blood. Jupiter, the planet of kingship, thus wounded, becomes another ectype of the divine king wounded on Calvary. Now, this shows us that Lewis very explicitly connects jovial symbolism with the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, which, of course, he's reworking at the heart of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Wherever we look in this story, we find the pervasive influence of Jove. Look at this woodcut from the Middle Ages. It shows you Jupiter enthroned in the heavens, and down on earth are the people who exhibit the jovial influences. So here we have a coronation scene, a man becoming a king. Here we see another man kneeling for judgment. Is his guilt going to be forgiven? And in the background, hopefully you can just make out horses and hounds, and they're off hunting the white stag or the white hart that kings and queens would hunt for in medieval romances. And if you remember, the final chapter of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe is called The Hunting of the White Stag. Is this all accidental? Is this just coincidence? Let's say, for the sake of your argument, that it is. That Lewis was just so steeped in all this imagery that it arose unbidden to his mind. It was an accident. Okay. <laughs> you know, for the sake of argument. But when we turn to the second book, Prince Caspian, we find that this is strangely martial. This is the Mars story. Mars is the god of war, and this is a war story. It's the Civil War of Narnia, the Great War of Deliverance, as it's called. Military episodes and escapades are everywhere in this story. 
And if you saw the recent film version, uh, you will remember how they went to town on the battle scenes. But you might say that there are battles in some of the other Narnia books, and you'd be right. So what makes this peculiarly martial? Well, it's partly the centrality of the military elements. It's partly that the very word martial itself appears several times in this book, but never again in any of the other chronicles. What clinches it, though, actually has nothing to do with warfare and everything to do with woods and trees. Here they are on the cover of the book. You remember, you remember Caspian's knocked off his horse by a falling tree. Lucy tries to wake the trees. The Telmarines are frightened of the forests. The trees come to the battle at the end of the story. Why all these trees? What's that got to do with Mars? What's that got to do with anything? You know, is it just evidence of slapdash? I didn't know this because my own classical education is very weak. But as soon as I began researching, I discovered very quickly that Mars in Roman mythology wasn't always and only a god of war. Originally, he was a vegetation deity associated with trees and forests, and he was known as Mars Silvanus. Look at this uh, mural from Pompeii, which shows you Mars in both capacities at once. He's the god of war, yes, with his shield and his spear and his helmet, but he's standing against a backdrop of burgeoning vegetation because he's also Mars Silvanus. And look at this image from Prince Caspian, which shows you both aspects of the martial influence in a single picture. Here we've got the single combat in the foreground, and in the background we see the gathering trees. And they are described in this book as dryads, hammer dryads, and sylvans. Only in Prince Caspian are the tree spirits sylvans. That's a coincidence? Maybe. Let's turn to the third book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. This is strangely irradiated by solar imagery. This is the sun story, which in a way you could guess from the title of the book itself, because this is a story about a journey towards the dawn, the treading the dawn, the eastern edge of the world. And when they reach the eastern edge of the world, Aslan is there scattering light from his mane. Earlier on in the story, we have seen Aslan flying in a sunbeam, towards Lucy. There's that episode on the island with the magic pool that turns things to gold. Gold, of course, is the sun's metal in medieval thinking. And as soon as they discover that this pool turns things to gold, they begin to squabble, the children, don't they, about who's going to take ownership of this island. And then suddenly Aslan appears on the hillside, shames them into silence, and we're told Aslan was shining as if in bright sunlight, though the sun had in fact gone in. Everywhere in this story, we have images of gold, illumination, light. But what clinches it has nothing to do with those themes, but rather the theme of dragons. The ship itself is shaped like a dragon. Eustace is turned into a dragon. They meet the great sea serpent. Why all these dragons? What's that got to do with the sun? What's that got to do with anything? Is this just e evidence of slapdash? No, it's part and parcel of the solar theme out of which the whole book is constructed, because in Greek mythology, the god of light was Apollo, and Apollo was famously a slayer of dragons. If you know your Homer, Homer's hymn to Apollo is all about the slaying of a dragon. And this is a statue of Apollo. He's killing that dragon, that, that lizard, with the beams from his eyes. So when, in... The Dawn Treader, this is a still from the recent film version. This is Eustace's eyeball as he's turned into a dragon. And you can see the approaching figure of Aslan there. When Aslan comes and pulls off the thick, dark, knobbly hide and turns Eustace back into a boy again, he is enacting the Apollo role. It's not just a convenient lesson about the process of conversion. It's part and parcel of the total theme which the whole book is designed to communicate. Let me just list the remaining four stories, and they are The Silver Chair, which of course you could guess is the moon story, full of wetness and wanderings and lunacy. The Horse and His Boy is the Mercury story, full of language and 
boxing and theft and running. This is why Aslan is swift of foot in The Horse and His Boy, because he's the true Mercury. And The Magician's Nephew is the Venus story, full of creativity. Narnia is brought to birth in this tale, but also a mother's life is saved by a magic apple taken from a western garden, which is clearly the Garden of the Hesperides. And the last battle is the Saturn story in which all of the characters who are alive at the start of the tale are dead by the end of it. And who brings Narnia to an end but Father Time with his scythe. Father Time and Saturn are the same character, mythologically speaking. And in a draft of the Narnia Chronicles, Lewis had actually originally called this character not Father Time but the god Saturn. It's there in the typescript. But when he came to publish, he thought, that's making it too obvious. <laughs> let's, let's hide my planetary themes a little bit more carefully. Let's bank on people not knowing that Father Time and Saturn are the same character. So if this theory is correct, why would Lewis do it? I think the first reason is simply fun. It must have been incredibly enjoyable. You know, Lewis didn't have to do any massive research. It was all at his fingertips. He'd been steeping himself in this imagery for decades. And when I mentioned my discovery to a, f to a man in Cambridge who knew Lewis in the 1950s, the, the, the friend said to me, oh yes, that's exactly like Jack. He would have roared with laughter as he did that. <laughs> he, he, saw it, he saw it as entirely in character. But there are two more serious reasons. One is literary and one is theological. The literary reason is the Kappa element the cryptic element, the pervasive atmosphere of a story, the seven spiritual symbols of the, of the planets allow Lewis to give each chronicle its own quality or flavour or tone because it's in every part of the story, which he thought was essential if you're going to reread a, a story. You don't just want a clever plot, you want a believable three-dimensional atmosphere as well. And if my own experience is anything to go by, he succeeded. Because I've been re reading these books all my life. And I haven't got tired of them yet. There's so much going on. They are so believable. That's the literary reason. And the theological reason is perhaps, perhaps the most fundamental reason. Because after all, Lewis said that the whole Narnia series is about Christ. But about Christ in two ways at once. Not just one way. Not just in Aslan, the incarnate word. But what we might call the discarnate or unincarnate word as well. The, the word of power by which God upholds the universe and everything in it, in which he manifests himself continually, if only we had eyes to see it and ears to hear it. But it's spread abroad across the tale, so, it's so large that it escapes us, like the large words on maps, which we don't see. But... Lewis is to Narnia as God is to the real world. Lewis knows his purposes. He's prepared to give the impression of slapdash, mishmash, hodgepodge. And if we dismiss Narnia uh, in those terms, then we laugh too soon. In a way, what Lewis has given us is a kind of enacted apologetic or enacted parable. You dismiss the universe on the grounds of its apparent randomness? Well, here's a story. What do you think of this? Is it random? It looks a bit, doesn't it? I know what I'm really doing. I'm working my purposes out according to my planetary scheme. And he's prepared to wait with a kind of humility, really. He was prepared to be laughed at. He was prepared even for friends to dismiss the books. But he knew what he was up to. This is an in incredible instantiation of his own personal faith as a Christian. He was working his purposes out down to the curve of every wave and the flight of every insect. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Emily, do you have a, a microphone back there? If you will raise your hand for your question, please say at least your first name. And uh, Greg, I think I see his hand up. So Greg, go ahead. 
Well, I just wanted to, first of all, thank you for a very fascinating and stimulating talk. Thank Certainly you. I can see your joy in your, in your research as you present, which is a lesson for us all. Um, I see a lot of parallels uh, based on your presentation and your research um, in Lewis with Bob Dylan. I think that Dylan, uh, with his lyrics um, and music, was doing similar things that it seems that Lewis was doing with his literary uh, skills mm. and his writing. Um, a lot of the Christian, uh, and, and for those that don't know the background with Dylan, a lot of his lyrics are overtly Christian uh, for those that are steeped in Scripture. But for the secular world, it just seems random like mm. you, were, you were saying. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the songs that Dylan wrote were later taken by people that were much more popular uh, during the time, such as Jimi Hendrix and All on the Watchtower. If you l read those lyrics, listen to the song, you can hear echoes of Ezekiel 3, Ezekiel 33 uh, in that song. And he later in life became more overt uh, and more bold. And as a result, um, Dylan kind of lost some credibility, uh, you know, in, in certain people's eyes. But at first and foremost, he was a poet. Um, I see what you're presenting is, is kind of a, a Trojan horse, so to speak. Mm, mm. Uh, a Trojan horse where... Um, you know, it's not so overtly Christian uh, that a secular person would dismiss it a priori yeah. uh, and give it a hearing because it is art. It is uh, complex, and it's not uh, slapdash, as you said. Uh, my second uh, maybe question to you would be, um, when did Lewis convert to Christianity? Was it because of the near-death experience? Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, because of that near-death experience during the First World War. Uh, that occurred when he was 19, uh, but he didn't begin calling himself a Christian for another about 13 years, in his early 30s. Um, I mean, he was raised a Christian, and he was baptized as an infant, um, but he didn't live into it until his early 30s, uh, thanks in no small part to the influence of Tolkien. Uh, and the word influence there reminds me of, you know, of Dylan. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. Uh, is that Dylan? Oh, in that? Yes? Yes. Thank you. Great. Good. Great. <laughs> um, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. Now, the wind, of course, in Scripture is an image of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and in medieval thought, um, the air was the medium by which the planetary influences exerted themselves over, over people and events. So that if you went to your doctor with an unexplained condition in the Middle Ages, uh, he couldn't explain what was wrong with you, he would say, oh, it's just the influence which is in the air at the moment. And if he was an Italian doctor, Lewis points out, he would say, it is the influenza which is in the air. <laughs> and we still use that word in, the in our medical language. Well, next time you go down with flu, attribute it to Saturn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Heimbach. Just a second, he's got the microphone coming to you. Uh, my name is Dan, and this is not meant to be terribly profound. Uh, I'm just curious, because I've had the question in my mind ever since I read it back years and years ago. But in the silver chair, can you explain the lady in the myrtle coat, the green lady? Green kirtle. The green kirtle, yeah. Uh, well, this, she is, this is what planet? This is Venus? The moon, the moon, the, the moon. moon, yeah. Okay, so what is the moon wearing a green coat? Good question. Um, green has many meanings. Um, it can mean fertility, uh, as in, as you saw in that picture with Venus with her green gown. There it means uh, creativity, fertility, sexuality, lushness. Um, it can also mean vegetation, uh, you know, in, in the martial sense. There's lots of leaves and trees in, in Prince Caspian. But green also has the meaning of envy, of course. And that, I think, is what Lewis is getting at there in the silver chair, that she's dressed in the green kirtle because um, she is the embodiment of a, a kind of uh, inferiority complex. She is envious of the sun, and she wants her own kingdom to be the only world. You remember when the adventurers get down into her kingdom, they, they look at the lamp and say, the lamp is a bit like the sun. We've seen the sun. It hangs from the sky, just like that lamp hangs from the, ce hangs from the ceiling. And she says, what? 
what ceiling? Where, what does it hang from up there? She won't believe, she won't allow that there's any kind of superior light above her own kingdom. So she's like what Shakespeare says in, I think it's Romeo and Juliet. Um, she, she is, she's got the, the moon's vestal livery which is sick and green. Uh, it's that kind of curdled greenness uh, Lewis is getting at in that particular image. Next question. Uh, over here. Say your first name. Um, my name is Cameron. Um, so my question was kind of just like a clarification um, sort of thing, just to kind of make sure I understood. Um, so like Lewis's reasoning behind um, doing the seven planets for the seven books, mm. was it to show Christ behind that pagan mask kind of thing? Like saying, hey, here's something that is medieval and has been around for a very long time and it's pagan, but here we can see kind of Christ in that as mm. well. Is yeah. that the reason why? Maybe I think so, yeah. I mean, Lewis had a very high view of paganism um, and thought that where paganism at its best uh, points to Christ in, uh, say, images of dying and rising gods. He talks about Balder and Adonis and Bacchus and the corn gods. Um, those great pagan myths are kind of prefigurations, as it were, of the true story of Christ. He is the true dying and rising god. But the pagans were granted dim premonitions of, of that historic truth in Christ. And it was when he came to see that there was a kind of continuity between pagan mythology and the Christian gospel, that was, that was a conversation he had with Tolkien and another friend, which really enabled him to become a Christian. Uh, that was a, a huge breakthrough for him. And so ever afterwards, in his, in his later Christian works, he's, he's constantly drawing upon Roman, Greek, Norse, even Egyptian mythology, um, and turning it to Christian effect as much as he can. He's, he uses the term baptized astrology in one place. Um, you, you wash it of, of all its lingering paganism and you just you get you 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 bring out the little gold nugget from the dross. Uh, that's what he's up to. Yeah. Question here at the front. Chris, just get the microphone coming. Sure. Hey it's Chris. So what's Father Christmas doing in Jupiter? <laughs> yeah, well, good question, because even before The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was published, um, some of Lewis's friends said to Lewis, Father Christmas doesn't really belong in this story, because the Narnians sh show no knowledge of a character called Christ. Mm -hmm. So what would they mean by Christmas? doesn't make sense. Even before the book was published, this objection was raised. So uh, Lewis had a chance to withdraw Father Christmas, but didn't. He evidently thought Father Christmas is essential. Essential why? I think because, well, let me go back a bit. In Lewis's university lectures, when he was lecturing about the planets, when he got to Jupiter, he would often say those born under Jupiter are apt to be loud-voiced and red-faced and jolly. This is my poor attempt at Lewis's, <laughs> Lewis's, <laughs> Lewis's uh, accent. He would then pause and add, it is obvious under which planet I was born. Because <laughs> he himself was loud-voiced and red-faced and jovial. Lots of people use the word jovial to describe C.S. Lewis, not recognising the particular significance it had for him. Now, who is the, the jovial personality par excellence in our modern Saturnocentric culture but Father Christmas? Mm -hmm. Loud-voiced, red-faced and jolly, the bringer of gifts, the bringer of jollity, to, to quote Holst's planet suite. Father Christmas helps crystallise that aspect of the jovial personality, which is otherwise all but vanished from our modern culture. And Lewis says in the discarded image that the jovial archetype has almost disappeared from our collective imagination. And I think this is one of the reasons he is so interested in starting the Narnia Chronicles with the Jupiter book, because... He's trying to rehabilitate the jovial archetype for, our, for the modern imagination. And Father Christmas is a, is a, a quick way, you might, you might say a slightly illegitimate shortcut to presenting that uh, 
spirit, but I think that's what explains his appearance. Okay. He doesn't belong there logically, but he does belong there atmospherically, mm. and that's why Lewis includes him. Next question, here at the front. My name's Daniel. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that you've, you've, you've made a great case for C.S. Lewis working out a great puzzle, and, and I, that's credible, you know, that he's worked out a great puzzle, but don't you think that he would, and, and don't you think that all great literature has a great puzzle behind it, that there's, mm. a, that there's a kappa element mm. in, in everything that's good like mm. this? I mean, mm. everything that's classic or that's enduring has that kappa element in it. Yeah. And so he was just tapping into... I mean, he was just writing a good work of literature, even though he was also working out this great detailed puzzle mm. at the same time, mm -hmm. putting feet to his whole his whole notion about the medieval image and the discarded image. Yeah, absolutely. And this is just sort of a working out of what he had already done. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and so, to that extent, it's 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 nothing new because all great literature has a capper element, uh, but. V not very often does the kappa element have a pre-existing reality, a pre-existing form which you can identify. Usually it's, it's just the new work of art which expresses it. Or if it's, a tr if, it, if it's an exact allegory, you can point outside the, the literature to, to the pre-existing form. But what Lewis is doing here, I think, is not strictly allegorical. Uh, it's not, I mean, you can't begin to dissect each chronicle of Narnia and say, oh, yeah, that's a Jupiter theme, that's a Jupiter theme, that's a Jupiter theme, and, and think, oh, that's what it means. It, it's, not, it's not that kind of process which he's undergone. It's, it's, more, it's a more, of a, it's a more mytho mythographical than allegorical process. He's trying to give a new myth to the jovial personality. Um, and you, Although I have necessarily dissected it and sort of atomized it in part tonight. I don't mean to say that I now view the Narnia Chronicles as just one vast allegory. Uh, it's much more subtle and that's much more truly artistic than that. Uh, so, you know, e each chronicle becomes its own sort of version of the archetype in question, with Lewis's own genius bringing it all together in his own particular way. It's not just a, a, a tired rehash of an existing thing. Did Tolkien's distaste for allegory, is, do you think that's what kind of threw him off the trail? I mean, he stopped following the trail mm. too soon? That's true, uh, yeah, because at the second level, the biblical parallels, you know, th there's some v pretty obvious allegory going on. And Tolkien said that he had a cordial distaste for allegory in all its forms. Uh, so, yeah, I think that was one of the reasons he disliked what, what little he knew of the Narnia Chronicles, yes. Um, but he didn't sit around and wait for the for the richer qualities. Thank you. Question here, and then the next one there. Thank you for your talk. My name is Riz, and uh -huh. I am one of the online students at the Houston Baptist University. But I'm not trying to be a commercial. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, you you mentioned in your talk about how Lewis liked. Um, to exploit those things in the past so that he can gain, as you said, traction with the audience. Uh, I'm wondering, is there a fine line in, in doing that? At, at what point do you say, I'm not going to do that because I might get pushback from the audience? So for example, mm. I, I live in Japan, and as a missionary, I'm trying to find at, to, to what degree can I use elements of Japanese culture without coming across as if coming across that I'm, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, capitulating? Capitulating to, to who I am as, 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 a, as a believer. There's a missiological question for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, do, do you mean compromising? Uh, compromising, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think Lewis thought that everything everything but sin could be redeemed. I mean, uh, nothing, nothing could need necessarily be excluded from a story just because it was part of the popular modern culture. 
Uh, I mean, Lewis, as it turned out, was not particularly interested in, the, in his contemporary culture. Um, so he, he, he had an innate tendency to look to the past, and in particular to the Middle Ages and, and classical times. Um, but I don't think that in principle he would have said that uh, another writer with a, uh, with a greater interest in the present day uh, could, could not exploit those elements for, for Christian purposes. No, everything in principle is, is usable because God is the father of lights, you know, to quote St. James's epistle. And Lewis liked that verse from James. God is the father of lights and all lights, a- any truth, any goodness, any beauty, insofar as it has a as has an illuminating power must be traceable ultimately to God, even if it's got a bit shady and uh, dubious um, on the way down to us. But that comes back to the question about baptism, about washing it and and cleaning it up and putting it to good effect. So I, I don't think that Lewis would have been troubled by that by that scruple, no. Though of course in, in practice it's difficult to do the washing effectively and, and thoroughly. So, yeah, there is a practical problem, definitely. I have a question in the back, and then Dr. Granham. Hi, my name is Landon. Landon, I'm a student here in the college. Um, so my main question is, you know, thank you for your talk, um, but if we were to take this interpretation or this um, way of looking at the Chronicles of Narnia, um, how does time factor into both the plot and the dates that with these pieces were composed? Because they were, aren't li- written in a chronological order in the in the story itself, mm. um, so do, how does that play into maybe the planets or maybe some Greek mythology? Where mm. just yeah, well, thank you for that question because it is important for me to say, which I haven't yet said, that when Lewis began writing the first book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he only had one book in mind. He didn't have the whole series projected at the outset. Uh, the series grew incrementally after he'd written his Jupiter book. He evidently said to himself, oh, I enjoyed that, let's try, try another planet. And actually the second book he began writing was The Magician's Nephew. Though he couldn't find the right shape for The Magician's Nephew and he set it aside. And actually it was the last book that he completed. Though it was the sixth that he published. So the order in which he begins them, the order in which he finishes them, the order in which he publishes them, they're, all, they're not necessarily sequential. Um, Let's remind ourselves of the order of the planets. It's, it's in a way inconvenient for Lewis that he began with his Jupiter book. Jupiter is the best planet, which he thought was especially in need of being imaginatively rehabilitated. That's why he starts with it. Um, but Jupiter, inconveniently, is neither the first planet nor the seventh. It's the sixth. So after, uh, after he's done his Jupiter story, where, where does he go next? It's, there's no very obvious forward movement except possibly what he did, which was to go to Venus, because Venus, the magician's nephew, is the second best planet. Jupiter was Fortuna Major, according to medieval thought, and Venus was Fortuna Minor, the second best planet. So maybe that was the the logical progression that he he chose, but I I don't think that he he worried about that particularly. and it was only after he'd written three or four of them that he seems to have decided that he would do all seven. But he had, f- he had completed four of them before the first was even published, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he was able to go back and make minor adjustments uh, I- as he needed to for the sake of the series once he knew there was going to be a series. <laughs> so, uh, so, I mean, some people say, oh, doesn't this frustrate the whole argument? But my argument is not that he set out with the intention of doing seven books. My argument is that he sets out with the intention of doing a Jupiter book, and then it grows. But each book itself is minutely projected, is, is minutely planned. There's, no, there's nothing <coughs> accidental or ac- incremental about that. Last question. My name is Anne Green, and I teach Islamic studies here. I was absolutely intrigued by what you had to say about everything can be redeemed and, has, and how that applied to a Japanese context. Did Lewis have anything to say about Islam? And if so, was there any hint that any element of that could be redeemed? Yes, there is. Uh, there's a very interesting episode in the last battle uh, with a character called Emeth who 
uh, he, he's part of this Calamine southern kingdom, uh, which is not exactly an allegory of Islam, but is pretty close. Um, and Emeth finds himself in the heavenly Narnia at the end of the story. Um, he finds that all his worship that he had given to the false god Tash has been, in mercy by Aslan, redirected to the true god, to Aslan himself. Um, which This disturbs some people who, who immediately accuse Lewis of universalism, but it's not universalism that he's depicting. Uh, he, he clearly depicts a hellish region in the last battle too. The characters all run up to Aslan and some look at him with, with love uh, and acceptance and others look at him with fear and loathing and they disappear into his dark shadow, which is the Narnian equivalent of hell. So there's a clear judgment uh, in the last battle, but there's also uh, an inclusivist uh, soteriology going on, whereby um, God, in his mercy, can save whoever he likes. Um, and insofar as MF represents an Islamic uh, worshipper, that would be the answer. Yeah, there, there is, there are there are um, elements of Islam in, in MF. Uh, though MF, interestingly, the name is Hebrew. MF is a Hebrew word meaning uh, fidelity or permanence, truth. Um, and that's, that's a, a giveaway that MF is a, is, a, is a true child of Aslan, even though he hasn't been given the, the grace of the, the gospel light during his life. 